Hello and a warm welcome to everyone. I'm Clarissa, a curator at National Gallery Singapore. I'd like to welcome our audience to this online talk, Time's Up, Conserving Media Art and the Inevitability of Change, a program which is part of our exciting exhibition, Nam June Pike, The Future Is Now, ongoing right now at the National Gallery. Pike was a video art pioneer seeing the creative potential in this new technology. He began creating television and video works since the early 1960s, some of these works which are on display in the show. From his use of cathode ray tube televisions to multiple projectors which provide an immersive experience, the exhibition has generated a lot of interest among our docents and visitors on what goes on behind the scenes in conserving time-based media artworks and how it's installed for an exhibition. At this talk, we'll be joined by various professionals who are rich in their experience on working in this field, and they'll be providing an introduction to this most stimulating field of study through some basic considerations on conserving time-based media, including analog carriers, such as tapes and optical media, and a specific case study, the result of which you get to see in the Nam June Pike show. This panel is quite global, for we have Patricia Falcao, a time-based media conservator at Kate, based in London, Andreas Weiser, a conservator and consultant for time-based media and audiovisual collections based in Munich, Germany, and Joshua Churchill, assistant manager of the collections technical team at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, who together with Tate Modern is our partner institution for presenting the Nam June Bike Show. We have a lot to cover today, so may I ask Patricia to begin with her presentation, giving an overview of time-based media. Thank you, Clarissa and, and the National Gallery for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure and it's a great panel. So looking forward to the other talks as well. So as uh, Clarissa said, I'm a time-based media conservator at eight. Um, and this talk is a very much an overview based on my experience there in this institution. And I think it's important to mention that we are a very large team in time-based media conservation and we've been working in this area. Um, Tate has over 20 years of experience caring for time-based media artworks. So I'm in a very um, lucky position. Um, so in my role, what I do is work with a fairly large group of people from artists to gallerists, curators and registrars to make sure that when a work comes into the tape collection, we have what's necessary to exhibit it according to the artist's requirements over the long term but also enable researchers to look into these artworks in the future and learn from how an, um, an artist worked at this point in time. But let's start to think a little bit of what we mean with time-based media. Um, in that date, we categorize those um, as anything that has the, the element of time as, as part of the work. And this means, for instance, film and its analog film that we are talking about. Uh, audio pieces or audio installations, which is what you're seeing here, performance art, uh, software-based art, um, and interactive pieces as well as this one, um, and video installations. And these can range from single channel videos from the 70s up to complex multi-channel video installations, as you can see here in this piece by Bishop Omuris at the Cool. Um, and so the question is then, what do these works have in common? Um, and there's a few things that are really relevant for, for their preservation that I'm going to just briefly talk about. And one thing is they only exist if they're turned on. For any of these works, if you shut the power down, the works are gone. Um, they also all, or except for performances, depend on mass technologies and mass industry, which is a, a con constrains the options for preservation. We can just hide in our labs and make our own paint as, as a painting conservator may be able to do. Um, these constituents are all ephemeral. So whatever you are using, it will get worn down. So if you have a, a video player in a, in a gallery running for 70 hours a week, as we do at Tate, they are bound to fail uh, within a short period of time. 
well, sometimes not that short, but in a, not forever, definitely. And so what this means is that change is inherent to their nature. If you're looking at a time-based media artwork, you know things are going to change sooner or later. Um, and so what is the role of conservation in all this? And uh, actually, time-based media has prompted a massive change in how people see conservation. And I think it's gone beyond what time-based media conservation to and, and contemporary art conservation to influence other areas as well. Um, and we went from thinking of conservation as a way of preventing damage and change so that people can still enjoy a collection in the future to being able to manage the change and to document an artwork so that we know what has changed um, and how it has changed and whether a change is acceptable and you still have the work in spite of that change or if, if that change is too much. And that's a big part of our role is to determine that. And so the, the way I organized my mind to think about this and to make sense of sometimes very, very complex works uh, is to consider uh, it to think of the constituents of an artwork. And it, for me, they're a bit like the materials in a painting. So if you're thinking of a painting and you have the pigments and the, the back, um, and for time-based media, that is also true, and we need to consider those. They're just a bit different. And so I find it useful to think of it like this. So you have the conceptual elements of the core of the work that, of, uh, that bring together uh, other four more concrete elements that are the display space where work was shown, the playback equipment, the media or the software or the data that is at the core of the work, and the display equipment, which is the equipment that that creates what the visitor sees in the gallery. Uh, and this is just an example. So for conceptual elements, it usually they usually derive from conversations with the artists and how they feel about the artwork and the different components of it. And that's mostly recorded in documentation. At that stage, we also take into account the curatorial reasons for uh, acquiring an artwork and why it felt it's felt that this artwork is is being collected and also installation specification so how does this work fit in the space and why is that so the display space can be extremely variable and influence how our work is perceived in this example we have the work primitive by bishop on Grisetical, as it was shown at fact in liverpool and you saw another image at the beginning of this presentation um, this image is how the work was shown at the tanks at Tate Modern. And in both cases, a bishop on worked closely with curators and conservators and technicians to adapt multi-channel video installation to the space, to the existing space. At the other extreme, an artist may require a specific space to be built. So literally the work will look exactly the same between these different uh, exhibitions. So now we turn on the light. Um, and you can see the display equipment, which depends, which must be chosen in accordance to the space uh, that is available to show the work. Uh, but also, um, it's also looked at according to the media that is going to be shown on that projector or, or that, that equipment. Um, so this is, refers to the media element. This is the, the, actually the artist's hard drive as supplied. Uh, literally what Apisha Pong uh, provided for this piece with all the oops, with all the files uh, that he provided that were, he's very thorough so the documentation is brilliant and he has multiple exam multiple types of files that he supplied for display. Um, but in, in theory at least uh, this, these are the elements that will change the least between the different displays. Um, and in there, the role of the conservator is, again, to avoid change and unwanted change, particularly. Um, and that's where the, um, conservators have learned a lot from the digital preservation context on what is necessary to do to ensure that something is received and is in good condition. Um, how do you condition check this each type of medium? And how do you store these digital files in this case for um, Yes, mostly digital files. Although this will vary greatly from medium to medium. And beyond that, you also have again the display and the playback equipment. 
that in some cases are just what is available and the best quality that a venue can provide and sometimes are specific and really important conceptually for an art track and that will affect how we preserve or how we approach that preservation. Um, and I think here there is a big um, call out to, to my colleagues who work in installations and that often will choose, for instance, a model of projector because it will fit not only the space where the projector is being used, but also the video footage. So there's a level of expertise there that is often, that is easy to oversee, but is essential um, if we want to support an artist in showing their work in the best way possible. And so what do we do actually to preserve these works? Um, first of all, we discuss and we talk and we ask a lot of questions. We tend to, uh, to talk to the artists if we can talk to them directly or the galleries and often their technical experts, the people that have the technical knowledge about how a work is produced. And that's very often not the artists themselves, but a video editor, a programmer that works with them. Uh, and at that point, we tend to try to understand what is the artwork, how it was produced, um, you know, what tools were used, what, what types of files or what type of uh, media was used, how did we get to the final object that we are receiving, um, what are the display parameters, how can it be shown, how can it not be shown, and how can it change, what can, can or cannot be changed. Uh, and then we do an assessment of what is at risk there and what will fail. And then we tend to discuss with an artist the option for preservation in the long term. So we will flag that some things are or not a risk and how they would like to see that approached. We also do a lot of research uh, on our own about uh, an artwork before we have these conversations with the artist. So we sort of do our homework and try and understand as much as possible. Uh, before we have these conversations. Uh, and so the outcome of this, is, or one of the key outcomes of this is to identify the significant properties of an artwork. So what is that, um, what are the aspects of this work that must be preserved for the work to be maintained? And it's sort of a, a fluid objective and th those may change and different people may think different properties um, are especially significant. Uh, in most cases, we accept what an artist feels is important, uh, but that's not always so. Uh, in this case, for instance, the image at the back is a, a printer, and it's a thermal printer from an ATM. And so when we discussed the piece with the artist, uh, Jose Carlos Martinat, the question was, if this, when these prints fa printers fail, and we know they will, they, they fail within a, a few thousand hours, um, then what should we do? with the idea being that, okay, if you can replace them with something that looks similar, they need to be thermal printers, they need to, they, usually they're used in ATM machines, so that should be um, you know, available for a long time, but what happens if those are not available? What would you like to say, to, to see instead? Um, with the question, with the answer then being, well, if it's really different, uh, if, you know, if you had to use an office printer, then you just have to hide it somehow. Um, so that there's still the printing of this, the, the, these little leaflets that you vaguely see there. Uh, but you know what, we know what we, what we need to do once we can't recover from these. And this is sort of a summary of how, how that works and how we think of, but this applies to everything, to hardware or software is thinking, okay, this something is going to fa fail and that's going to trigger changes to your whole system. So for instance, in one case, if you can either repair that piece of hardware uh, or you can't. And then if you can't repair, then what happens then? And in, in, in some cases that means for instance, for, for the Lausanne, for the, for Brutalismo, that means that you end up having to change your software for it to, um, for the work to continue to function. And so it's understanding how an artist might feel about that. Or maybe if you need to do something preemptively to, for that to be possible in the future. And so all of the processes that we've mentioned, that I've mentioned until now, 
at the core of all of it is documentation. And this is something that we gather as soon as possible when an artwork comes into the collection. Um, and we put a lot of effort and resource in doing so um, as part of what we call the acquisition process. Um, this is just a, some, uh, an example of, of the type of documentation that we may gather. Um, and of course, this is then complemented every time an artwork goes on display, we will learn more um, and things may change. The opinion of the artist may change. So we know that whatever we know about the work is likely to evolve as the work is displayed. But also if you need to do any sort of intervention, then you want to know what that intervention was. And, um, and that will also you know, change our understanding of an artwork sometimes. And so this is sort of just a simplification, a very broad idea of the main uh, preservation strategies. Um, and so storage, again, it's not that different from other objects. Everything needs proper storage, be it hardware on a, a warehouse with controlled environment. And this is good for, um, you know, any piece of equipment is better off not getting too hot or too cold or too wet. Um, and then migration when it's necessary. For instance, if we receive um, analog videotapes, we would aim to digitize them as soon as possible. Uh, just um, even, even if we need an analog for display, it is best practice now to create digital masters. Um, and then emulation is more when a strategy for software that we tend to use um, preemptively. Um, and the idea of all of these is that you think about them at the point of acquisition so that you can also later on, you, you are uh, allowing yourself, or you're keeping the option of, of intervention as broad as possible, basically. That is the, the thought behind all of this. And covering all of this is, again, documentation. And for some works, what we see, it, you know, it, this documentation can be anything from a legal contract to a display specification of the work in the gallery to, to a video of a, a software-based artwork. Um, and that was it. Patricia, thank you for your presentation. It covered a lot of basic fundamentals on time-based media. And I think it's quite interesting that you approach time-based media from the viewpoint of failure, that one needs to be prepared for equipment to fail and to have a backup plan for it. And speaking of failure, for our next presentation, we have the degradation of audiovisual media presented by Andreas. So before we start, I want to welcome you all to my presentation about the degradation of audiovisual media. My thank goes to the National Gallery of Singapore for the invitation to this talk. I feel very honored that I was invited to be part of this panel today. The topics of my presentation will include the degradation of analog carriers like videotapes and optical media. They were the pre predominant distribution formats for video art since its beginning. Nowadays, these data carriers are considered obsolete, but a huge part of this artistic content is still not digitized and set to risk due to degrading carriers. Even after digitization and long-term preservation strategy is a core task for audiovisual collections, since thumb and hard drives aren't safe storage solutions either. My presentation will cover the main risks and typical signs of degradation with analog media, optical carriers, and hard drives. So let's get started. To give you an idea how a tape is constructed, we will take a very short look at a cross-section of an audio tape. Tapes are constructed of three parts, magnetic layer, substrate layer, and backcoat. The substrate layer can be made from cellulose acetate or polyester. The magnetic layer consists of a binder which holds the particles on the tape surface. Binder is also present in the back coat of the tape. Most of the problems with tapes today are related to binder system, um, to the binder system of the magnetic layer and the back coat. But what are the main risks for magnetic tapes? We can identify three main threats to magnetic tape binder degradation, mechanical breakdown, breakdown, and climate-related problems. So let's start with the degradation of binder. This is a chemical problem and can be divided into two sections. First, the vinegar syndrome, 
which affects only tapes made of cellulose acetate, and this means it is only present at audio tapes since videotape never was produced with cellulose acetate. Secondly, we have hydrolysis, which affects tapes made of polyester. This means that audio tapes, uh, that audio and videotapes are affected with this problem. But first, we take a look at the vinegar syndrome. The main reasons for breakdown of cellulose acetate tapes are the aging of chemical components, cheap quality of the used materials during production of the tapes, and improper climate conditions during storage, because high temperature and relative humidity can cause decomposition. What are the indicators of the vinegar syndrome? You can detect affected tapes by their odor. If the tapes smell like vinegar, the tapes are degrading. If you see signs of shrinkage or the tape breaks easily while being played back, the tape is also in a critical state of degradation. Other signs are brittle tapes and when tapes are forming a U while being played back. The problem is that the vinegar syndrome affects the binder and the substrate film. And once the reaction is started, it can't be stopped. And this is how a shrunken and brittle tape looks like. The tape is not wound smoothly on the tape reel. It has formed sections and is building a U-shaped form along its edges. In consequence, the tape can't be played back properly in the playback machine. Besides the smell, a degraded tape lays back in an irregular manner. The physical deformation leads to playback problems, not only causing improper tape head contact. The whole playback process is disturbed due to the flipping of the tape. And because of, because of its deformation, it can't be wound back on the take-up reel smoothly. So the question you might ask, how can vinegar syndrome be cured? Well, there is so far only one viable solution, and even this is not working with every tape. There is a patented process of relubrication which can help, but it's not always successful. That's, his, that's why it is always recommended to store tapes at a dry and cool place. But we are not finished with chemical problems yet. You remember that we talked about the hydrolysis. This schematic illustration shows what's happening with, with hydrolysis. First, the water molecules from the humidity in the air are absorbed by the tape surface. They start a reaction in the binder with parts of the polyester. As a result, parts of the polyester chains break into small fragments. These fragments have an increased polarity compared to the other polymer. This different polarity leads to a migration of the broken parts of the binder to the tape surface while the tape is being, being played back. While this sounds very theoretical, this is how it looks like in practice. Dependent on what chemical composition the degradation products are, the residues will appear in white or black. These residues will collect mainly at metal parts of a cassette housing, like in this photo, or in a playback machine. At a playback machine, you would find these sticky residues, for example, at the tape guides or um, at the um, rollers of an audio player, like on the left side. In video players, you would find these residues of sticky shed at pinch rollers or the capstan of a player like on the right side. In audio machines, the sticky residues at tape guides will lead to a squealing sound during playback. After a few minutes of playback with squealing sound, the tape will be stopped due to increased tape tension. When you play back video tapes affected with sticky shed syndrome, you will likely see this behavior. During the playback, the sticky residues collect at the video heads and contaminate the small gap of the head. In consequence, the video heads can't reproduce the signal correctly and the picture gets blurred at first. And in the end, the signal is lost and the machine stops playing because the tape tension gets too strong. Again, you might ask what to do with against this problem. There are special designed tape cleaners which can clean affected tapes, but mostly you would also add add a thermal treatment to the tapes, which is often called baking. Both actions will help to play back the tape, but they are no durable solution. Tapes will become sticky again after a certain period of time. Another problem we are facing with tapes is mechanical breakdown. One of the most common reasons are poorly maintained or unmaintained players. If tapes are played back in such machines, scratches and abrasions on the surface can be the consequence. In mild cases, you only get a bad wound tape and the tape pack shows irregularities like on this schematic drawing. Although you might think this is not dramatic, 
it can have serious consequences. Single protruding layers of tape in a tape pack can easily be damaged or might be bent when feedback into the cassette. But misaligned players can also damage large areas of tape. In this player, the tape guides were not working properly, so the tape was guided too low in the machine. In consequence, the tape was folded around the lower part of the tape guides in the video player. And this is the consequence. A tape with folds, dents, scratches, and other mechanical problems will not play back properly. Every single distortion on the tape surface will lead to visible playback problems. The worst case, of course, is a torn tape. Once a tape is torn, it can't be glued together invisibly. Most of the cases, you will have significant loss of information afterwards. But also climate-related problems can have a huge impact on the integrity of tapes. As you can suggest from my explanations regarding hydrolysis, a humid atmosphere is not a climate you should choose for storage of your tapes. But it is not only that a humid atmosphere will accelerate degradation of magnetic tape, it also can initiate the growth of mold. Mold can grow at levels above 65% relative humidity. This photo shows mold on a pneumatic cassette. When I opened this cassette and looked at the tape surface, I found this. The fungus was grown into the tape surface. In this case, the content was lost at the contaminated areas. Rapid changes of climate conditions put physical stress to the tapes, so sometimes the tape pack shows distortions like this. During humid conditions, the tape absorbs water and expands. When the tape is put back into a dry area, it shrinks slightly. Several cycles of these climate changes can result in physical stress in the tape pack, which can lead to severe damages in the tape itself. This is especially the case if the tapes get stretched. In some extreme cases, the stress can get so heavy that the inner hub of open reel tapes is pressed out of the tape pack. As you can imagine, all this leads to the strong advice to store your tapes in a dry and cool area. And more important, without rapid changes of the climate. Storage, storage at relatively constant levels will make sure that no additional stress is put to the tapes. Furthermore, a dry environment will help to, pre to prevent hydrolysis. But not only tapes seem to be vulnerable media. The same goes for optical media. Optical media are mostly using a polycarbonate backing with one or more reflective layers where the information is stored. This information is kept in what it is called pits and lands, the small dots and lines you can see in this comparison at the top of the picture. Depending on what disk type you have, the density of the information differs, and so does the wavelength and the color of the laser which writes or reads information. Another difference between CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, and laser discs is the place where the reflective layer is located. While laser disc, which is not shown in this comparison, CD and Blu-ray have their reflective layer at one side of the disc, DVDs are made like a sandwich where the reflective layer is put between two discs. Having the, the reflective layer unprotected at one edge can be pretty dangerous for a media. That's why you should avoid putting adhesives on the surface of a CD laser disc or any optical media. The plasticizers of stickers can migrate into the surface and damage it irretrievable. You also should be aware that recorded optical media can be very likely get damaged by exposing them to direct sunlight. The UV light will expose the photosensitive layer and making it unreadable for the laser. So let's move forward to hard drives to get an idea if these are the safer option for data storage. Modern hard drives are typically in the form of a small rectangular box. As electromechanical storage devices, they store and retrieve digital data using magnetic storage. And one or more rigid, rapidly rotating platters coated with magnetic material. The bladders are paired with magnetic heads, usually arranged on a moving arm which carries the heads. These heads are reading and writing the data to the bladder surface. While the arm with the heads is in service, it literally flies the heads over the bladder, reading or writing. If during that action a sudden mechanical shock occurs, the head crash can crash into the bladder, causing a so-called head crash. If this happens, all data stored in the damaged areas are lost. 
But not only head crashes put your data on risk when stored on a single hard drive. Like any mechanical device, hard drives can fail by different means when in service or when they sit unused on the shelf. One of the big data storage providers regularly publishes the annualized hard drive failure rates in its data centers. And this shows that some of their hard drives are more reliable than, than others. Some models seem to fail more likely and might be not a good choice when it comes to long-term storage. One could think that flash drives then might be a perfect solution. They have no moving parts and no spinning bladder. However, SSDs use semiconductor cells to store data and these cells are basically electron traps. Unfortunately, these electro uh, the electrons will leak over time, but they will leak much faster if you store your SSD unpowered. In other words, an SSD with no power will lose data faster than SSD SSDs which are in use. So SSDs aren't the best option for long-term data storage either. Now you might ask if there is no safe data carrier to store your data on. Unfortunately, there is no. The only way to keep your data and your content safe is to make redundant copies and store them at different locations. These different locations might include a cloud service or an own cloud, but they shouldn't be built on optical data carriers. It is recommended to use hard drives or data tapes when it comes to large collections. So your long-term storage should include redundant copies at different locations. It should have integrated fixity checks and a write protection. That's because one thing you should always be aware of. One copy is no copy. And this archival rule is even more valid and important in digital times. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation, Andreas. I think what you've shown is extremely useful as artists of different generations who've worked with the moving image would have worked in these different carriers you mentioned, such as VHS tapes, DVDs, flash drives, hard drives. But speaking of old media, we have now a presentation by Joshua on Namjoon Pike's TV crown and how this was conserved in time for our exhibition at the gallery. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the National Gallery of Singapore and the organizers of this conference for inviting me to present our work on the subject. Today, I'm going to give a presentation on the comprehensive conservation treatment of Namjoon Paik's TV crown, modified cathode, cathode ray tube or CRT television artwork from SF MoMA's collection. This presentation was co-authored with my former colleague, Martina Heidvogel, who is currently a lecturer at the Bern University of the Arts within the Contemporary Art Conservation Training Program and was SF MoMA's previous media conservator. I will first give a brief introduction of the artwork and then walk through the points of action that happened between the moment it was acquired in 2015 to its current moment on tour at the National Gallery of Singapore. Namjoon Paik's TV crown is a sculpture that utilizes analog audio and CRT technology to draw colorful dancing figures on a monitor. This concept was first realized by Paik in 1965 and then recreated in several later versions. SF MoMA's 1999 version of this work consists of two audio signal generators, a custom-built audio tube amplifier, which was designed by Shuya Abai, an engineer that collaborated with Paik throughout much of his career, and a modified CRT television. The two audio generators genu generate individual sine wave tones, which are each fed into the two channels of an amplifier, where they amplified before reaching the CRT television. Within a CRT television or monitor, the video image is drawn onto the phosphor-coated front panel by an electron beam, which is emitted by electron guns. This beam is deflected by the deflection yoke in the vertical and horizontal direction. For TV crown, Paik manipulated the monitor in a way that the two signals from the audio generators are being fed to this deflection coil. In other words, each of the two audio signals are deflecting the electron beam on the Y and X axis respectively. The interactions of the two audio signals based on frequency, amplitude, and phase differences between the two can result in patterns known as Lissajou figures, like these shown in the images. In TV Crown, 
the Lichra Zoo figures are being displayed by the modified CRT monitor. To be clear, there's no video signal being represented here. The only the deflection of the electron beam by the audio signals. Originally, visitors were able to interactively dial in these figures and as such make visible the audio signals on the screen. Over time, certain patterns were identified and designated as motives for the work. On the left, you'll see the crown-like figure from which the artwork takes its name. And on the right is a pattern we refer to as the butterfly. Through discussions with John Huffman, the curator of the Namjoon Peck Estate, we confirmed a select number of patterns that are approved for exhibition. If you look closely at the displayed figure, you'll see that the white line is being split into its primary colors, red, green, and blue, as well as other color variations of orange, purple, and yellow. These splits in the signal are caused by an additional ele electrified coil aptly named the dancing Z coil, which causes not only the color separation of the white line, but also causes the pattern to appear to have depth and movement. When dialing in each pattern, the speed and intensity of this movement is as important as the shape, size, and proportions of the patterns. Another modified CRT work by Namjoon Paik in SF Moments collection is Zen for TV. In this work, Paik disabled the deflection of the vertical axis, causing the entire signal to collapse into a single line before he moves the monitor onto its side. When closely examining these works and their functionality, it becomes clear how connected they are to their technology and that they cannot simply be migrated to a flat screen or digital video. After TV Crown entered SF Momo's collection, one of the first steps we took was to document the custom built tube amplifier and confirm that it was safe for months long exhibition of eight hours of display a day. We worked with an electrical engineer who examined, examined all of the components of the amplifier and drew us up a schematic. As part of this examination, he found that the amplifier was actually designed to run on 100 volts, which we hypothesized was due to it being built in Japan, where that is the mains voltage. He advised us to use a variable AC transformer, or a variac, to adjust the incoming AC voltage, which is 120 volts in the US, for presentation, and additionally to ground the aluminum chassis of the amp for safety. After completing this work, we felt this artwork was now safe for exhibition. To recap, the amplifier plays a crucial role in amplifying the audio signals so that they are strong enough to deflect the electron beam inside the monitor. If this deflection doesn't happen, the electron beam will collapse to a single point of light in the middle of the monitor, where its continuous strong beam will damage the phosphor layer of the monitor, which we unfortunately learned the hard way. A few weeks into the exhibition, we were called by the museum guards who told us that the work didn't appear to be functioning correctly. Sadly, by the time we arrived in the galleries, the damage was already done. One of the amplifier components had failed and the large pattern that had collapsed into a single small intense circle in the middle of the screen, where the electron beam irreversibly burned a brown halo into the phosphor layer of the screen. After this incident, the work was taken off view until the amplifier could be repaired and a safety measure could be devised that could prevent such an incident in the future. We had the same electrical engineer come back and he quickly found the culprit, a faulty diode in the amplifier. However, knowing any component failure within the amplifier could create another catastrophic event. We asked him to build a so-called kill switch device that is installed in line between the amplifier and the monitor that monitors the signal levels leaving the amplifier and also acts as an automatic power switch to the television. If the signal drops below a certain adjustable threshold, the kill switch will automatically cut power to the CRT television, thereby turning it off. Thus, we implemented a safety feature that now prevents any future damage to the monitor by a faulty or low level signal. This incident Made, made it clear to us how fragile the technology was that we were dealing with and how important it was to look into further options to preserve the work. Due to the unique nature and fragility of the custom modified monitor, we consulted with Namjoon Paik, the Namjoon Paik estate and decided to explore the idea of having a functional duplicate or exhibition copy built to function both as a backup unit as well as something that could be lent for loan requests. 
As TV Crown was slated to travel in the summer of 2020 for one of the later legs of a touring exhibition that SF MOA co-organized with Tate, London, we began actively pursuing the production of an exhibition copy of TV Crown in 2019. In preparation for the touring PAIC exhibition and the production of the exhibition copy monitors, Martina and I took a research trip in early 2019, focused on the maintenance and repair of unique CRT television works, particularly those by PAIC, which is when we first met with CRT technician C.T. Louie in New York City. It was at that time that we first inquired about whether he would be interested in working with us to create exhibition copies of TV Crown and Zen for TV. We were particularly interested in working with CT as he worked directly with Nam June Paik throughout much of his career and continues to maintain some of his works that are in permanent view and has actually created exhibition copies of TV Crown and other Paik works in the past for other institutions. As CT Louis confirmed interest in working together, we began discussing the details of the TV Crown exhibition copy as each iteration of this work is slightly different. Fortunately, CT already had a monitor in his workshop that was similar to ours and began modifying his to match the appearance and behavior of ours. The original plan was that I would travel to CT's workshop in New York in April of 2020 after the modifications were complete to inspect the work in person and advise on any additional adjustments if necessary. This all changed of course due to COVID when it became clear that travel would not be possible in April of 2020. With that in mind, we decided to attempt to do an inspection and quality control session via video call that July. Knowing that reviewing the work remotely would be a challenging endeavor, I prepared various pieces of documentation for reference ahead of the call, including photographs that we had taken at the museum of the various on-screen patterns, as well as video we shot in the galleries of the SF, of SF MoMA during the testing and installation of our TV crown. As expected, many of the details we were looking for in the video images did not translate well over the video call. However, after a lengthy review, we felt we got as close as we could to our goal with the means we had at hand and approved the monitor for shipment back to us. The exhibition copy monitor was shipped to us along with an off-the-shelf consumer solid state audio power amplifier, two signal generators that were similar to ours, and a power supply and variac to adjust the Z-coil as seen in this photo. To compare the exhibition copy to the original monitor, I connected the outputs of our original pair of signal generators to an audio distribution amplifier so that I could feed identical signals to each respective power amplifier and monitor. In this video, our original monitor is on the left and the exhibition copy is on the right. In this shot, you can see the signal sources are the two signal generators shown here, the original tube amplifier behind it, and just to the right of that is the audio distribution amplifier. When comparing these two monitors, we noticed that the lines appeared slightly dashed and strobed more in the exhibition copy, and that there was more blue in the exhibition copy monitor image compared to the evenly distributed colors in our original. These are some of the de details that could not be easily observed during the video call. However, we encountered a bigger problem while testing the exhibition copy monitor. It would automatically turn off every 10 minutes. After some discussion, we decided it best to, the best course of action would be to send the monitor back to CT to fix the power problem, and if possible, do some adjustments on the line quality and color. By the time we were preparing the shipment of the monitor back to CT in March of 2021, we had all received our COVID vaccines, and CT had offered to travel to San Francisco to do the repair and adjustments in person as well as teach us how to perform some work on the CT mon CRT monitors, such as swapping out circuit boards. We very happily took him up on that offer, especially since we had just installed the PAIC exhibition at SF Moment, and would now have the opportunity to compare and contrast the exhibition copy of TV Crown to the original with CT Louie in person.
During the first day of working with CT at SFMOMA, we swapped out the circuit board in the TV Crown Exhibition Copy Monitor with a couple he had pre-programmed and brought with him. We identified one that would automatically turn the television on upon receiving power and did not automatically turn it off after a period of time like the previous one did. And we used that as the primary board. We had identified another circuit board that we would save as a backup if needed. The other modification CT performed on the boards was to cut some of the wires that connected the board to the yoke. Those are the disconnected white wires in this photo. These previously allowed video to enter the signal path. This modification eliminates any potential on-screen display or video noise to affect the on-screen patterns. Or as CT Louis put it, the resulting lines and patterns were now only displaying the deflection from the signal generators. What this means aesthetically is that the lines were no longer dashed the quality of the lines was much smoother, the strobing was significantly reduced, and the color distribution was no longer biased towards blue. Since our original TV crown was installed in our galleries at the time, we took this opportunity to set up the exhibition copy monitor and power amplifier next to it on a day the galleries were closed to the public in order to perform an AB comparison to the original. Similar to the last time, we used the original pair of signal generators for the audio signals and an audio distribution amplifier to feed each respective audio amplifier and television identical signals. After performing some lowering of the brightness on the exhibition copy by performing some internal adjustments inside of the monitor to match our original monitor, we were surprised to find that the lines and pattern on the exhibition copy monitor were actually less dashed and strobed less than our original. While we were satisfied with the line quality on the exhibition copy at this point, the outstanding difference between the two displays was the color distribution of the lines. The original displayed the primary red, green, and blue lines and white where all three overlapped, but also had intermediate colors such as oranges and purples. While the exhibition copy showed only the primary red, green, blue lines and white where the three overlapped. CT explained that this was because the purity was properly adjusted in the exhibition copy monitor and that it was modified, whether on purpose or accidentally, in the original monitor. As there was a de desire to bring out these additional colors in the exhibition copy, CT Louis demonstrated that one could do so using a de degaussing coil in an unconventional manner. One could bring the electrified coil towards the screen as you normally would when trying to correct a color shift but if you turn the coil off while it is against the screen and the colors are shifted, it essentially stays that way. After a few passes, we achieved the color distribution that we were looking for in the exhibition copy monitor, where it was exhibiting a fuller range of colors. Once we received curatorial approval on the exhibition copy, we disconnected the internal degausser inside of that monitor so that the magnetization of the shadow mask would not reset each time the monitor was powered on. Here's a demonstration of CT Louis performing that modification. Okay. I use a magnet coil. Normally, we, we use the, the dowsing is to even out the picture. But since I don't want to even out, so I leave the thing here by flipping off, and that will be permanently recorded. But shutting off the electrical. Shutting off. Thankfully, the TV Crown Exhibition Copy Monitor was completed in time to learn to the National Gallery of Singapore, the last stop of the Namjoon Paik Future is Now exhibition tour. The kill switch that we had created for our original was also sent as an additional safety measure for the Exhibition Copy Monitor. We recently oversaw the installation of this work via video call as we were not able to travel for this installation. While we faced Similar challenges during the review of the video patterns on screen as we did during the remote examination of the exhibition copy with CT Louis earlier on, the work functioned as intended and was ultimately installed successfully, proving the worth of this lengthy project. Creating an exhibition copy of an artist manipulated monitor not only provided the museum with a version of the work that could be more easily scheduled to go on exhibition or loan, but it also supplied the framework to closely examine the original artwork, its functionality, and image characteristics. The information so generously provided by CT Louis and the experience gained from undertaking the project deepened our understanding of the work, and it will now permanently enter the artwork's documentation record and may someday be the source 
for another extensive conservation treatment, whether it's CRT technology or not, and the knowledge to repair it is still around. Uh, that concludes my presentation on the technical conservation of TV Crown. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for your presentation. I think what each of you has presented has transitioned nicely from one to the other, from Patricia's introduction of time-based media and how it's divided into those various components. Then Andrea's focusing on the particular component of audiovisual media, like videotapes, optical media, to files stored on different drives, and how these are always subject to deterioration. And like he says it, one copy is no copy. And Joshua actually takes us through exactly that, how SF MoMA made an exhibition copy of Nam June Pike's work, TV Crown, for the exhibition. So I would like to start with a question for Joshua. Like, how does one learn of this technical side of equipment, which is important not only for conservation, but installation as well? A lot of the old equipment is not being produced anymore, at least not widely. So it feels a lot of the knowledge is disappearing. It doesn't seem like there are many people like C.T. Louis, the CRT technician whom you mentioned in your presentation. And I was also struck by this, uh, leaving the museum one evening and all throughout the National Gallery are like quotes by Nam June Paik. And one of them is, there is no rewind button on the Betamax of life. And there were these young kids who saw it. I think they were maybe in their early 20s. And they read it out loud. And they were really asking each other, what's Betamax? So like, how can a new generation, a younger generation, learn about the old equipment when it's so hard to find? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question, I think something that made this particular exhibition and Nam Ju Paik's work uh, really unique in this period of time. I mean, the fact that he was working with, with um, kind of antiquated technology at this point uh, and a lot of analog technology that didn't exist before a lot of viewers were even born or is not being produced um, anymore in, in real time. It's, it's, it creates a, an interesting context where they're seeing something for the very first time where we have these these kind of preconceived notions of where these these live in history both as consumer items and as um, potential material for artwork um i i, th I think um, nam june's work in particular is is interesting because a lot of it relies so heavily on this these uh, these pieces of, of electronics as sculptural material not just as um, vehicles for for images. So, in a lot of ways, I think this is a great introduction um, for folks that haven't grown up uh, using these things to see all of the different aspects of of how they could be used and uh, contextualized as artwork. Okay, and now I'd like to also um, ask Patricia a question. Uh, Patricia, like you mentioned, that you work in you know in tape which is quite fortunate to have a large team which is dedicated you know, to time-based media. So what would you advise museums who don't have any you know, specialized conservator on time-based media? How should they care for their time-based media collection works? Or if they're thinking of acquiring time-based media works, um, if they haven't started acquiring or, already? Hmm, that's a good question. I think if, unless you're very fortunate and you are in one of the places where you can hire a freelance time-based media conservator, which are still very rare. Um, and I mean, that's, we, we hire freelance time-based media conservators as well, just because um, our staff is not enough for, for the amount of work we have. <clears throat> I think you want to start building your team to be able to do that. I think, you know, at Tate, we centralized a lot of, of the work that we do around time-based media is based by on the conservation team. That doesn't always have to be like that. You know, you have technicians that are extremely capable and often very curious and just as thorough as a conservator can be. Uh, you know, you have curators and registrars that 
but you do need to build the momentum in the institution and in seeing this as an exciting opportunity rather than a lot more work again on top of a already large workload. I think that's everyone's problem, right? So you either make it an institutional decision and you have a group of people on board that can take that forward. Um, and then you, you, know, you, you find someone to come and, and help you and train you. Um, or you, you decide, okay, we're going to hire one person and probably assume that they may not have the, the experience because, again, those, there's not that many of those either. Uh, but you, are, you provide them time for training and, 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 and research, really, because even, even you have, if you have the experience, the technology that is coming, up into, coming into the collections, you, you often don't have any experience of it, whichever background you have. So... It is a role where you, you, you know, even after over 10 years of experience, you're, you're still being faced with new problems and new technologies um, every, every month. So, yeah, it, it, yeah. there's no super bullet, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where does like one also go for these kinds of um, training? You know, without having to undergo like multiple year, like are there like short courses that are being offered? Um, I think you need to pick and choose a little bit. I mean, you you are probably aware of the there was a summer course at the University of Krems where where we met, and they're offering that again, I think, but it is a very broad degree. Um, I don't, and then you can take, you know, you can have shorter courses on media preservation. I, Andreas, you may know better than I do what is on offer by, by JV preservation community rather than the time-based media and art conservation um, areas. And the same for digital preservation. So you, you can learn about digital preservation more widely and not necessarily within the, the, time, the, the art conservation world. Uh, there are workshops taking place at um, IFA, Institute of Fine Arts in New York are doing a, a series of workshops online and, you know, with the pandemic, that's the one good thing is that if you look it up, there's a lot going on online. So even if you are not in London or New York, or <laughs> you can still um, attend events. Um, but yes, it's, it's pick and mix and you need to just look for it and be a bit lucky <laughs> that things are happening when you need them. Yes, lucky. I mean, that's also, yes, like how, how we met as well, like with that um, short course on media art preservation. Uh, I have a question for Andreas, and it's something that was really struck by your presentation where there was in all caps, dry and cool. <laughs> and I, I think this is um, very interesting in the context of Singapore. Uh, well, even Southeast Asia, because if there's one thing we're not, we're not dry and cool. <laughs> we're quite the opposite. It's very hot and humid here. So you, you can just imagine what a nightmare it can be actually for um, conservation for, you know, time-based media works or even just other works um, in general. Uh, so would you have any kind of, you know, advice on like the storage for these works? Like, especially like, for example, for artists who aren't part of any institutions and they have their own um, files, um, whether that be on uh, DVDs or in hard drives, like, should they maybe like purchase like a, a dry box or something and then just kind of store it there? I mean, what's something like on a kind of an individual level people can do to keep um, their precious work safe, apart from also copying it into multiple different platforms, which you've emphasized? Yeah, um, so I, on purpose, I didn't uh, give any figures uh, on which degree uh, centigrade and, and, and how humid, but I think so the most important thing is to to avoid from any mold. So this would mean that you have an atmosphere which is not 
too much above 65 percent relative humidity and um, the the problem mainly occurs with tapes so if you have a tape based collection um, then i think it's much more important to check what kind of conditions you have in which climate you store but the most important thing should be if you have a, a collection with a lot of audio or video tapes uh, you should put your money in digitization projects because um, these tapes are old and they they will degrade because they were never meant to to last for 50 years uh, some of them are now older than 50 years and um, they they are not meant as a storage media for the for for yeah for the eternity they were just meant as a, a media only for usage time for, for maybe 10 or 15 years so now you need to move on on the next media so and i think uh high humidity is not so big problem for hard drives but there we are facing other problems so that was uh one of the baselines i wanted to um emphasize that as patricia said so um we are the role of, co uh, of a conservator is to avoid um, um, that the, the intention of the artwork change. So this this um, this means that that these artworks are changing and and copying from one media to the next one or from one uh, analog carrier to a digital carrier. This is part of their um, yeah nature, so to say, and um we need to 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 make sure or to make yeah yeah to make sure that, that it's not only how you store it you need to digitize it and to transfer it migrate it to newer technologies and this is an ongoing project you you won't find an end point for yeah for video art so because it's always changing and you need um this transition from one carrier to the next one so it's like a constant migration yeah i would say that yeah right yeah i mean one thing that i was also um struck i mean you said that you know for uh works that are on tapes we should like avoid mold at all costs um and of course i've uh, recently encountered uh tapes that are in artist collections where it's too late. There's already mold. <laughs> There's already mold. Uh, and I've actually been um, trying to search for, you know, proper vendor to do the, um, you know, tape cleaning and digitization um, locally. And I think what really struck me was that there were really just such few options. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, even like uh, um, you've mentioned um, in presentations of yours before um, that I've attended uh, separately that, you know, there should be like these proper kind of like tape cleaners um, to clean these tapes, but I cannot find anyone um, who has it in Singapore. So, you know, they there are these kind of like mom and pop shops yeah. You know, do you like these digitizations? And it's a bit like, mm, do I, you know, do I do it with them or, you know, but to not do it at all, I feel like it's something, it's a worse option. And I think like what you said before is just really like, it's not going to get any cheaper or any easier the longer yeah. that you wait. I mean, the, the uh, presentation of, of Joshua showed this clearly when it comes to CRT monitors. Um, it's, it's getting harder to find people who are trained and skilled enough to uh, maintain old monitors and even the monitors itself get older and older and we won't have any spare parts in the, in the near future. So um, I think this is, yeah, this will be a, a big problem how to uh, to manage um, CRT monitors and works which are yeah relying on on uh, CRT monitors works like like from from Namjoon Pike they aren't able they, they won't function with an LED uh, flat screen they need a CRT monitor yeah so that's um, the, and that's important yeah to connect 
worldwide as specialists to work with um, the people who are still in service and yeah, to help these companies to survive and to, to serve for uh, museum collections, for, for, for instance. And, you know, connected to that, I wanted to ask like um, Patricia and Joshua as well, like in your own respective museums, like do you stockpile, you know, certain equipment that's now like hard to find, like uh, for cathode ray tube televisions, like for general use for different artworks, like how do you determine how many to stockpile, what size, is this something that you, um, check regularly also this equipment that you retain? Um, I, I can start with that. I, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's no clear formula on that. A lot of it is really calculating uh, repairability and availability of equipment, especially things that are out of production um, and just how unique that particular piece of equipment is. Um, for example, you know, some of the, the works that we've been discussing are um, not just unique in that the equipment itself is no longer available, but that they're modified in a particular way, um, which circles back to, to also the, um, the expertise of, of people like CRT technicians and how valuable that is to, to absorb as much of that um, in the present as we can. Um, but that's definitely something that is discussed and thought about even at the point of, of acquisition and considering the acquisition of works is what is the long-term viability of collecting a certain artwork uh, based on what the, the artwork is made up of. Um, but we do, depending on what it is, we, um, if we know there is a risk of not being able to find a spare of a particular piece of equipment in the future, we do proactively um, seek those things out um, the quantity just depends on what it is and how available we think it is um, currently and into the future. But it's really a case by case basis. Um, I'm curious to to hear what Patricia has to say and how how they think about that. Oh, it's pretty much the same as you're saying. I think the other uh, the only other aspect that you need to take into account, given the size of a CRT monitor, is how many you can fit in your storage. I don't know how well you do, but it is literally, you know, you are thinking, okay, I have this amount of space and you could, I mean, nowadays you couldn't even, but you know, you could buy a hundred CRTs that would keep your works going possibly, I don't know how, for the next 50 years, if you're very lucky, but then who pays for that? So storage in London is not <laughs> negligible. The cost of storage itself is also an issue. So yes, we buy, we would, at acquisition, we would assess how unique a piece of equipment is, how easy it is, is it, is it to buy it? Can we still buy it now? Can we, is it going to be a few months on eBay waiting for something to, to come up? Um, and sometimes artists will provide extras themselves. So we have a few examples of that where an artist is aware of how unique a piece of equipment is. And so they supply it, not only one for display, but also a couple of backups. But yeah, it, it, it depends a lot. It also depends on the budget that you have on that year for, for equipment, but you should have one. If you are buying anything, any time-based media art, you should have a budget for equipment. Yeah, right. I I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Go ahead. What I found uh, interesting is um, nowadays it's um, during the acquisition process, it gets harder to decide whether you should acquire a, an artwork which includes specialized equipment or obsolete equipment because you have to decide if you put a lot of money into an artwork and you don't know if you can display it in the next 10 or 20 years because maybe there are no CRT monitors anymore and if you need for one artwork uh, let's say 10, 10 um, CRT monitors all the same brand all the same size then it can be a hard decision to make if you acquire this artwork because what will we do in, in 10 years do we have enough um, CRT monitors and will there be a replacement which is satisfying from from the visual effects and the appearance i don't know so um 
if I had a wish list, I would, uh, yeah, I, I would wish um, that there is one vendor um, trying to set up a new CRT plant <laughs> and build new CRTs because just for the art market. One of my colleagues, Chris King, did look into that at one point and he found a, a factory in China actually that would do but they would only do one size and you needed to order a few thousand of them and that was like well that's a then you know then you have a worldwide project of all the museums coming together to buy and you end up with you know five thousand crts with all museums showing the same crts which might also be a bit against it <laughs> so i don't think there's a solution i think maybe that's one of the type of artworks that will eventually die or at least in that form, and they will exist as documentation. Or you, which for the bikes is really a shame, really. Yeah, I, yeah there, there was, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I was going to say there, there was a gentleman in, in the US that was kind of filling that need for a little while. Um, he ran a company called Dotronics, but a lot of his practice was based on, um, sourcing parts of the CRT monitors and kind of rehousing them. Um, but he, his production has slowed down significantly just based on, on supply. Um, and it's, it's drying up everywhere for technology that's, that's no longer being currently produced. Um, I mean, it, it really, and, and it makes me think about um, circling back to that question about, you know, spares. A big part of that is also um, just variability in artworks. Like if something is really dependent on a particular like model and size and how, how difficult that is to, to source, source things for, or if it can be widely variable, like a lot of Nam Jun Paik's works where it just has to have a certain look or feel. Um, and that, that kind of also circles back to the importance of documentation and, and what, what it is that makes an artwork important and that, that really weighs the importance of acquiring spares and how difficult it is to, uh, to identify them. And I mean, I think the way Pike used CRT monitors is really unique and it's about the CRT monitors. The, the other way we use CRTs a lot is for early video works that are still, four by three aspect ratio, so like almost square. And we prefer to show those, those on, on CRT monitors because that's what it would have been used originally. And then you come to a point where you're like, well, you're, you're almost there where you can get a screen of the size that you need with the proportions that you need. So may, there might be a moment where that becomes possible with a different technology, with LEDs or well, LEDs or whatever. Um, and then, you know, you move away from the CRT, but for many works, it's a loss, but it's a minor loss compared, compared to not showing them at all because you don't have the, the right or the historical equipment. So there will be a gauging of that. I mean, for works where you're, you're um, manipulating the, 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 the CRT tube, it doesn't work, of course. I mean, one thing that kind of like emphasized, um, you know, throughout um, your various presentations, is just the importance as well of documentation. But what if the artist is no longer available like for an interview? Like who identifies the significant properties of a work or it can say like, oh, actually this one we can, you know, show it using newer equipment. Like who makes that call, who determines that? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, it would be a curator. You know, someone that knows the artist or the artist's work and understands. And, you know, we, we would usually collaborate because from, from a test technical perspective together with, with the curatorial perspective and, and find a balance there. It is tricky. I mean, I, I am working on the acquisition of a work that is an installation by an artist that died in the late 90s. And his son is still here, but he never saw the installation. There's very little documentation 
and there's 12 channels of video. So we're kind of going like, well, the artist wrote a text explaining the, the concept of the work, so you can display it in a way that reflects that. But it's it's you know it's almost a poetic text that you then interpret. But maybe that's okay, you know. You 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 are representing a work anyway for for uh, for a new generation and for people that are seeing it in a very different way to how it would have been seen in the seventies when the videos were created. So, you know. It's it's fine. Change is okay. <laughs> in most cases, if you put a CRT, a CRT, um, sorry, a bike work in a in a flat screen, I'll probably be very very sad. <laughs> to otherwise, I think yeah. change is good. And I guess uh, to conclude, um, I'd like to actually ask each of you, like, what you think is the future of time based media, given that media is always changing. I mean, lately I've been hearing a lot, like the buzzword is MFTs. I still need to kind of like wrap my head around that. But yeah, what do you see as kind of like the future um, for this discipline? I, I mean, I think it's, it's ever evolving and the pace at which it's evolving now is faster than we've ever seen. And it's, it's interesting to see these newer technologies contextualized with, with older technologies, um, such as, as uh, Nam June Paik's works. And it, it just, it places things in history in a different way. And I think it, it informs um, how people think about technology, both newer and older technology. But it's, it's, it's anyone's guess where it could go. I think it's, um, it's pretty infinite where what will be encapsulated in the the idea of time-based technology and time-based media art. Um, I, I would say, I mean, when we prepare exhibitions now at the museum, almost every exhibition, regardless of department, has some some form of time-based media in it. And it's it's just becoming very normalized, which is which is great because it also normalizes support and research around the subject. But in terms of a definition of what media art can be, I, I feel like that's ever evolving and evolving incredibly quickly. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, I mean, just looking at how the Tate collection has grown over since I started working there, so 12 years ago, it, it is, you know, you're, you now go to a museum and you expect to see video art or, or, or software-based art. And it just, uh, it just becomes more common. So you are seeing m many more people being trained in the field and being comfortable dealing with technology. Um, so I think we're, we're getting to mainstream. <laughs> well, if you can talk of mainstream in conservation and contemporary art, but it's like, we are now also starting to, to work with what you might call traditional conservators. Uh, you know, we, we are now having artworks that are sculpture or, or paper that have digital elements. And we are seeing our conservators for those specialties being involved as well, because there is this need to, to conjugate the, the digital with the physical. And you know how do you print something correctly, which is an expertise that my colleagues in, in, in painting in paper conservation will have that I don't have. So that there will be more and more of that mixing, I think, of specialties in conservation. And I think that that um, you have to remember that media was or, or yeah, data carriers were very expensive when you look back. So and now they are kind of cheaper so they are getting normal more more and more people are using uh, time-based media on their daily basis uh, with their smartphones so it's kind of a uh, normalization from an exclusive expensive media like film or videotape uh, in its beginning and now it's getting cheaper and cheaper so everybody's used to that technologies and artists are using these technologies completely naturally it's it's because it's it's something we have all around us every day so um 
yeah and and as long as artists are inventing new things or using media um, and technology in a creative way like Namjin Pai did that with the CRT monitors and manipulated it um, as long that we will have new uh, or in, a, in other words new technologies will um, will bring new ways of artists working with new te technologies and as long we, as we have new technologies around us we will have new kind of kinds of time-based media artworks around us and we as, as conservators need to adopt with that and as you said okay now maybe nfts are a new technology and they will maybe um, challenge us conservators but we will find ways to cope with that and yeah maybe we meet next time and speak about on which blockchain um, an nft is uh, better for long-term preservation than on the other so maybe yeah we should meet in one year and, and talk about that topic <laughs> would be a pleasure thank you so much again to our speakers for those uh, really amazing presentations and which really i think gives the public like a good overview of time-based media conservation bye thank you everybody goodbye thank you. Bye, bye bye thank you bye take care bye